The following program is brought to you by Caltech. And with that, let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, Fiona Harrison is a professor of physics and astronomy. Uh, unlike most of the uh, faculty here, she has her own telescope. It's called, <laughs> she, she's the PI of New Star, which is an X-ray telescope, which is uh, a NASA project. And so uh, she's gonna tell us about exploiting the combination of New Star and Keck. Thanks. So not only is uh, Caltech a center for optical astronomy, it's also a center for space astronomy. And we've had a number of small missions, like the GALAX mission, that, oh, that was um, conceived, developed, and the science was led out of Caltech. Uh, New Star is another example. We also, in the building next door, we operate the Spitzer Great Observatory, uh, the WISE mission. And one thing all of these space telescopes have in common if, is that they've benefited tremendously from being able to partner with Keck to achieve their science goals. So I'm going to use uh, New Star as an example. So New Star is NASA's smallest scale of astrophysics mission. It's called a Small Explorer. Uh, as you can see here, we launched on June 13th, 2012 from the Reagan test site on the Kwajalein Atoll. And uh, it's a fairly unique kind of launch. Uh, it's a small rocket that sits under the belly of an L-1011 spacecraft. And in fact, if you look at, I just want to call your attention to the length of the uh, airplane, the part of this that contains the science payload is this little part right here, okay? And I should point out that Orbital was actually a company founded by one of our Caltech trustees, Dave Thompson. Anyway, so we launched on this uh, Pegasus rocket. The plane took off and then went out over the Pacific Ocean, and we couldn't actually see the launch. All we could see is what uh, an infrared camera on the belly of the uh, aircraft captured which was this rocket dropping and then taking off. And I should say this very uh, auditorium with, was packed with Caltech students and postdocs watching this happen. And we had the NASA you know, voice feed coming in saying, you know, ready, mark, four, three, two, one, drop. We're up and away. And they forgot to mention that there's a delay between the video feed and the audio feed. So I think my students, some of my students anyway, uh, had, had a few seconds of, of terror, but everything worked great, <laughs> and we got into space. So what kind of telescope is New Star? Well, it's an X-ray telescope. X-rays sound very exotic, uh, and, um, but actually they're just electromagnetic radiation, just like the visible and infrared radiation that the Keck telescopes view, only they're higher in energy, shorter in wavelength, okay? Uh, than the visible and infrared, okay? So this just shows you the electromagnetic spectrum. And what I'm pointing out here is dividing the X-ray band into low energy X-rays and high energy X-rays. So we've had great observatories like Chandra and XMM, you may have heard of them. Uh, they have viewed the heavens in low energy X-rays. New Star is the very first time we have a focusing high energy X-ray telescope viewing the cosmos. And so New Star can make images uh, that are 100 times crisper and more sensitive than any we've had in this part of the spectrum before. So uh, why do we study the universe in X-rays? Well, because we can observe things that are very hot. We can observe regions where particles are accelerated very close to the speed of light. And also, X-rays are penetrating, so we can observe uh, regions of the universe where they're, uh, that are hidden behind uh, dust and gas. So you may, let me just call uh, your attention to one thing here. New Star's big. It's about the same size as Chandra, which you may recall was a shuttle launch because it was so big, all right? 
So you may be thinking then, well, how is it the case that it launched on something that was a small fraction of the length of an airplane? Well, so here's my equivalent of stress polishing mirrors, all right? So we sat review board after review board and said, look, we're going to take thousands of little tinker toy-like pieces and we're going to fold them all up into something that looks like a trash can and then they're going to perfectly unfold and they're going to lock into place and we're going to end up with a stiff telescope that's good enough to do astronomy with. Yeah. <laughs> so, here we go. Here's my equivalent of Ed Stone's fast-forwarding building uh, the Kex. This is New Star after it got into orbit successfully. Uh, and this is an animation, not a real video, of course, of the Tinker Toys unfolding, perfectly locking into place. Oops, why did that stop? Ah, sorry, I think I can't click this thing. So I don't know if you watched the Mars landing. This was my equivalent of seven minutes of terror, only it was actually 24 minutes of terror, and I was far more worried about this than the launch because I knew exactly what, what went into engineering and testing this. But it was successful. And so now New Star is on orbit, pointing at the universe, and taking the very first crisp, very sensitive images of the high-energy X-ray sky. And so what I want to do is just illustrate using two examples of how New Star is partnering with Keck to do amazing new science. So just to give you a feeling for the uh, qualitative improvement that New Star represents, this shows you uh, an area viewed by the previous best, this is a billion dollar ESA Cornerstone mission, by the way, high-energy X-ray telescope that we've had in orbit. It works like a pinhole camera. This is a region that's about twice the diameter of the sun by about four times uh, the diameter of the sun. And you can see there's a few point sources you can detect. Something like Chandra would see thousands, if not ten, five, 10,000 sources in this region. Here we've been able to detect a few. Here's one pixel in that image blown up and viewed by New Star in the high energy X-ray band. And this is a very special pixel on the sky because it contains the heart of our Milky Way, right? So right here you can see we've taken this kind of blurry pixel and here you can see the heart of the Milky Way. That red thing is actually the remnant of a previously exploded star. This blue thing down here is a knot where particles have been accelerated very close to the speed of light. A wealth of information in this image that we are analyzing and understanding. So now I want to tell you what New Star was doing on July 21st of 2012. Now this was officially uh, before we were supposed to start our science. So we interrupted our previously programmed schedule. Don't tell NASA because we weren't officially supposed to be doing science. But we knew that Keck was going to be looking at the center of the galaxy on this night. And we said, OK. We're in control. We can do what we want. We're going to look at the center of the galaxy, too. And let me give you some context as to why. So um, at the very heart of the Milky Way, at the very center, lies a 4 million solar mass black hole. How do we know this? Well, Keck, one of the great advances of Keck, with a little tiny bit of help from the BLP, uh, watched over years the orbits of stars going around this black hole. And we could tell that because of these orbits, there had to be so much mass packed into such a small volume that it had to be a black hole. Many astronomers consider this actually the first proof of the existence of black holes, OK? But the weird thing about this black hole is it doesn't shine very brightly. There's lots of dust and gas near this black hole. And what usually, well, what often happens is the dust and gas, it falls onto the black hole, it heats up, and it radiates, and it becomes very luminous. But our Milky Way black hole is only 300 times the luminosity of our sun, OK? So it's really dim. And furthermore, we can't see it in the visible. There's just too much extinction. The, the bands that we can see it in are the radio, the near-infrared, where Keck uh, adaptive optics operates, and in the X-ray. And every day or so, this sort of wimpy black hole burps. 
it gets 10 to 100 times brighter for about an hour. And we really don't understand why, but we thought, heck, we could get lucky. We could, you know, Kex looking. If we see it too, then we can put together a very big uh, part of this puzzle by looking at the two bands together. And lo and behold, here is our image of the galactic center. Here it is at about 600 UT on this particular day. Here it is a couple hours after that. And here it is a few hours after that. Big flare. Unfortunately, we didn't catch this whole flare simultaneously with Keck, but we have caught others, and we've seen activity uh, together with Keck. And here, I love this picture. This is a real photograph taken by the Subaru telescope operator on July 21st, the night we were looking, all right? And you can see the two laser beams pointing up at the Milky Way. And my husband, who's a lawyer, right, but a very smart one, I came home and I said, look, honey, here's Keck looking at the Milky Way at the same time as Newstar. Isn't this great? He said, no, they're not. If those beams were pointed at the Milky Way, they wouldn't converge. They would be parallel, which is true. So we got into the fact that they're actually pointing at the atmosphere, right, and making a star that we can use to correct Keck's images very precisely and get a nice light curve of uh, the black hole burping. So I'm just going to tell you uh, high level what we've learned from this so far. So the big question is, well, why are we interested in these flares in the first place? Well, one reason is because they're probing what's going on. What's the environment near this uh, massive black hole, the closest one that we can really study, all right? And uh, we know that the infrared emission that Keck observes comes from electrons that are moving very fast, and they're in a magnetic field, and they're radiating. But it's been a mystery what causes the X-ray. Chandra has seen these flares, but it, it hasn't had enough wavelength coverage, enough, seen enough colors to really be able to tell what's causing the X-ray emission. But with New Star, we can tell that it's also electrons in a magnetic field, but electrons that have very, very short lifetimes. They will only last a second if there weren't some process that's pumping energy uh, back in. And by putting this uh, infrared and X-ray view together, we can also tell, there's somewhat more detailed argument that I won't get into, that this flare has to be coming from very close to the black hole within, say, eight times the Schwarzschild radius. All right, so these th this is very happening very close. And what I'm, so this is really putting a lot of constraints on the hundreds of models that theorists have come up with for what's happening. And one of my favorite models, it still works, luckily, is that some people believe uh, there are clouds of asteroids orbiting this black hole. And if one of them were to come close enough and get tidally ripped apart, it could make one of these flares. So maybe someday we'll have enough data to prove that's true. But at any rate, uh, we've made big advances through this partnership between Keck and New Star. So now I'm going to uh, shift gears and tell you about another uh, series of observations where we're partner partnering uh, Keck and New Star. And this goes back to uh, Gwen's talk. As you uh, will recall, she talked about how uh, over the time since the you know, universe was a few billion years to now, galaxies have changed and evolved a lot. And, and so Keck is studying uh, that, as Gwen told you. The part uh, that's, that New Star is looking at is it's looking at over approximately the same epoch in the history of our universe, how are black holes growing and feeding, all right? And how is that changing over time? Now, why the X-ray? Well, if you look in uh, optical or infrared, mostly what you're seeing is starlight, okay? It's hard to pick out whether there's a black hole that's feeding uh, at the centers of any of these galaxies, because by and large, the, that light is, is outshone by the light from all the stars. However, if you look in the X-ray band, the galaxies themselves, the stars are very dim, 
uh, largely invisible. And what you see if you just point an X-ray telescope at some region of, of the sky is mostly black holes. But what you're seeing is not the black holes themselves, of course, because they're black, but you're seeing the matter in the galaxy that is falling onto the black hole. And as it falls on, the uh, friction turns some of that energy into heat, and it, and it radiates. And we pick these out very well in the X-ray. And here's a, a field that the Chandra X-ray telescope has, has looked out to pick out the black holes. Now, so why hasn't Chandra finished the story? Well, because in many galaxies, there's dust and gas. And low energy X-rays are readily absorbed, uh, more readily absorbed by dust and gas than high energy X-rays. In fact, the energy of the X-rays that New Star uses are exactly the same as the energy that your doctor or dentist uses to penetrate through your skin and, and image your bones, all right? So what New Star is able to do is even for, uh, in this range where things in the universe are changing, uh, we're able to uh, look at uh, black holes even if they're behind significant amounts of dust and gas. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, fine. Black holes are probably rare and exotic. They probably don't influence much. So, you know, that doesn't sound very interesting. Well, in fact, let me tell you three amazing things that we've learned over the last couple of decades. One, every massive galaxy has a massive black hole at its center. That was unknown a couple decades ago. That's actually thanks to Hubble and in part Keck. Uh, further, there's a relationship between where we can measure the mass of the black hole and uh, the mass of the, the bulge or this, you know, sp the spherical part of the galaxy. And this relationship is about, the black hole mass is about a thousand times the galaxy bulge mass. That's shown in this plot. You don't have to worry too much about the units, but you see there's a line that connects these points, which is uh, this axis is telling you some, the black hole mass, and this is telling you uh, the, basically the mass of that spherical region of the galaxy. The other amazing fact, number three, is that the rate at which galaxies form stars is roughly a thousand times the rate that black holes are, are growing, taken in a statistical sense. So this could be coincidence, but probably not. There probably is some relationship, kind of like what Gwen was talking about when she talked about how stars forming can put energy back into the galaxy, right? Well, maybe black holes, as they feed, can put energy back into the galaxy and influence its evolution. So this is what we're trying to get after, is this connection. And we know the high energy X-ray band is a key part of the puzzle. Because if you look, point an X-ray telescope at the sky and you say, where is most of the energy coming out in, in, from these radiating black holes, it's in the new star band. It's not in the Chandra band, OK? And this is the best image we've had of a couple degree area on the sky in the high energy X-ray. No resolved sources. This is bright glow from the cosmos. Real X-rays coming from black holes can't pinpoint any of them. We just know they're very bright. When new star finishes its surveys, which we're about 20% through, we'll have resolved Hundreds of these black holes will be able to uh, measure their broadband X-ray properties, all right, and see how bright they are in the X-ray. But why do we need Keck? Well, what can an X-ray telescope measure? It can measure how bright something is in, in, in X-rays, but typically there's no way, there's no markers in the X-ray colors for us to, see, to measure a redshift, which both Gwen and, and Richard have talked about, all right, that means uh, which we can convert uh, into a distance. For that, we need the optical. So here is where we're partnering with Keck. We, don't, we want the optical to get a distance. I should say we also want the optical to get the properties of the galaxies that these feeding uh, black holes Lion. So here's a spectrum. Whoops. Wait, how did that happen? <laughs> Wrong button. Uh, so this is at one of the ways New Star is surveying the universe is we're covering some contiguous areas of the sky, 
But we're also just finding serendipitous sources in, in extragalactic pointings, and we can follow these up and get their distances with Keck. So here's one uh, serendip that, great being at Caltech, because we can get the you know, observations quickly, get uh, the distances, understand the properties of uh, the galaxies, so we can start to put this uh, connection together, together over a much uh, wider range of, um, of galaxies. So I'm going to end here. I want to end with this picture. Okay, so this is just some of the New Star team. It's a little bit date, outdated now. We have a few more postdocs and students uh, that have come. But one thing that the Keck telescopes and New Star also have in common is that students can go to Keck and they can say, I'm going to look at this, point the telescope here. They're the first ones who get to see the data come down and experience that thrill of, I'm the first person who ever looked at this data, right? So New Star, we have the students and postdocs and walk into science operations. They can download the data. They can be the first uh, to see it. Here's my student, Varun, who's actually now gone to uh, a nice position uh, in India, but he did his thesis joint on Keck and calibrating the New Star detector. So the other thing we have is students get hands-on experience building things, and so this, and the students who are working on Keck, that's where the next generation is going to come uh, from that dream up the next uh, telescopes and instruments for our observatories. Thank you.